Today's topic is the natural stages of growth for home educators. Now, I'm sort of known for my natural stages of growth for home for writing that I have developed for children to help you sort of place them and figure out what your reasonable expectations need to be. But what we're looking at today are the natural stages of development in home education as the homeschool instructor. So if you are the home educating parent, this is specifically for you. If you are married to someone who is not a home educating parent, this may also be a helpful guide for them. I feel like sometimes it's just as valuable for the other person, the spouse, who isn't doing the homeschooling to understand the journey you're on because this is a really unique career to embark on. Most of us go into home education without any training in teaching or developing lessons or having a degree in the philosophies of education, what creates a learning moment. Most of us who go into it are completely unaware of the world of homeschooling. We don't even know anything about it until we've already committed to doing it. How many of you have experienced that? Do you know what I'm saying? In other words, you hear about the idea of homeschooling, but you don't actually know anything about it. You're sort of captivated by a vision, but you're not actually aware of what it's going to entail. <laughs> it's probably one of the only jobs people ever embark on with that disposition. I mean, would you go into medical transcription without knowing what the job was? You wouldn't. So what we typically do is we are drawn to the notion of a bonded family and getting to be a participant in all of our children's firsts and the idea that we can provide some kind of education that would be better than or different than the school system. But we don't really know what the heck we're doing. We just sort of, well, Number one, we just jump in. This is the ocean. These are the splashes that come after you've jumped in. <laughs> we are using today, instead of note cards, all of my um, paint chips <laughs> because right now I'm working on my bathroom and I have all these paint chips and I thought, let's recycle. So the first stage is called jumping in. Jumping in means that you have decided, I want to do this thing. I don't quite know how to do it. It's like jumping into the ocean without swimming lessons. It's like motherhood. Um, oh, you want to see the color? Here's the color. Dover white. <laughs> you guys are so hilarious. I'm not using this color, by the way. Um, but anyway, it's this idea of when you go into pregnancy the first time, or you go into breastfeeding for the first time, or you go into the adoption process for the first time. You know you want the outcome, but you had no idea what it was going to take to give birth or adopt a child. Both of those processes are invitational, like you know you want the result, but you are totally unfamiliar with what it's going to feel like once you're doing it right. So I call that first stage the jumping in stage for homeschool. And here's, here are some of the properties of jumping in. Enthusiasm. You know, you're happy. You're like, oh, this is going to be wonderful. You know, just like when you're pregnant, this is going to be wonderful. I will have a child that I love. So you're going to jump into this homeschooling experience with this is going to be wonderful. It's going to be so much better than school. We're going to have all of this bonded connection. We're going to spend time savoring all these subject areas. We're going to do these experiments and go on field trips. And there's going to be the beautiful filtered light coming through the curtains. And my children are going to sit right at the table with pencils poised, waiting for all this wonderful information that I'm going to deliver to them. Them. Does everyone recognize that feeling? <laughs> and isn't that what happens with birth too? You start out with this, oh, my child is going to be so grateful to be as loved as ever by me. And so we expect that they will embrace the moment as fully as we did. Now, for children, hey, Monica, for children, one of the differences is they did not have to get up for homeschooling. 
they're just going along living in your family living their lives and you make all these big decisions whether to put them in school or keep them home or pull them out or put them back in like that's what's going on for them they're sort of like I live here I do what my mom and dad tell me and along comes you with this bundle of enthusiasm we're going to do this and your whole ego is riding on how well they receive it that's where we get into trouble because for your kids they're just giving you real feedback because that's what kids do yuck I hate this cereal yum I love candy right they're not trying to validate your maternal behavior by saying you're right mother I prefer this whole grain cereal to candy for breakfast that's not what kids do <laughs> kids are like I want candy and moms are like whole grain cereal right so that's a little bit what's going on with this jumping in moment you're coming loaded with enthusiasm very little experience zero realism and your kids are just living they're just showing up being who they are okay the jumping in moment lasts you know these are going to be numbers that are variable but it lasts anywhere from the six months to a year because during that first year no matter what ages your kids are your enthusiasm will carry you over many obstacles you will find yourself so convinced so thrilled by the idea of homeschooling that when a child box or doesn't read right away or finds it difficult to use the math text you picked your unbridled energy for this new vision will help you just like steamroll over it you'll just go buy find, go buy another book or go find a friend who helps you figure it out you will expect that you're just one or two tweaks away from that fantasy how many of you know that feeling it's like initially the obstacles don't feel that big they're just sort of like oh well of course there's an obstacle I'll just barrel through it I'll just figure it out that's all part of the jumping in moment right and it feels like I'm just a tweak or two away we aren't at that point reconsidering everything <laughs> you miss those days of delusion <laughs> who said that thank you planted trees I know it I know it so that's what we all go through right like we hit that wall and we're like okay well I can fix it I'm I'm just a minute away I'll just hop on a homeschool blog or go to my favorite homeschool forum and someone will give me the magic formula to get back on track okay so usually lasts about a year could last a little bit longer but usually the second year is different than the first year and here's why the first year is filled with newness so everything's new and you're actually a little more forgiving of yourself during the first year you are more likely to say I don't know in the first year and you're willing to forgive yourself for not knowing okay because you are new to this experience it's sort of like moving to a new country the first year is exhausting it's overwhelming you take a nap just after you go to the post office because it was so much work to talk to the postal worker in a foreign language that's what it's like you're in a new country it's exhausting but it's stimulating there's new sights and sounds and opportunities and the challenges you figure oh I'm gonna get good at this the challenges will go away so you have all this stamina but the second year in a foreign country we always say it's the hardest year because nothing is new and everything is hard how many of you remember that the second year of homeschooling is hard you've already got a year in your enthusiasm is dampened a little bit and now the things that you thought should work easily don't feel like they're gonna work as easily this year or your kids are throwing up their resistance and you don't know what to do with it because that hasn't been your focus so the second year looks like this or the second stage I call it playing school playing school isn't that a great drawing I really want a lot of compliments for this wonderful building <laughs> I was so excited that I thought to put in hedges okay playing school thank you see I just need a little affirmation and Angela delivered thank you Angela <laughs> okay so <laughs> I love you all so much you're so helpful all right so here's what happens in that second year a lot of times we almost revert to childhood where we're like 
I'm going to have a little classroom in my bedroom. Do you remember that with your stuffed animals and your best friend and maybe your baby sister and you sort of set them up and you stand in front of the room and you're playing school and they're filling in books? That's a little bit what we're doing in the second year of homeschool. In fact, someone brought up marriage. I think it's the same thing. The first year is really rocky, really new. It's all these good, bad, hard, wonderful things mixed together and you're playing house. You know, you're like, I remember wanting to play house. I'm going to make really good meals. <laughs> like, I'm going to hang matching, you know, um, tea towels on my oven rack so that I have a beautiful kitchen. So initially in homeschool, yes, we want our own homeschool room. We want to have our little, you know, child-friendly bookcase. We're going to have this perfect set of supplies that are available at all times. And our kids, yes, a flag and maps. Exactly. We're going to start the day with the Pledge of Allegiance. We're all going to sit together at the table and I'm going to rotate child to child and give personal attention while the others wait patiently for their turn. I call that playing school. And so often the playing school moment includes some kind of curriculum that you have adopted that is supposed to solve all of your dilemmas about how to teach. So if you just get that right program and you set up your schoolroom and you pick the time of day you're going to start and everyone's had a decent breakfast, now we're going to have school. Usually it's combined with a lot of lesson plans or calendar programs, especially today where everybody's into beautiful lesson planners. Let's be honest, it's just fun to fill them out, but it's really hard to implement. And so during the second year, you've already jumped in and now you're playing school, just like you're playing house. And those lesson planners are beautiful and reassuring, but what happens? What happens? It doesn't go well. <laughs> You get in three or four months like I did, and my son Noah told me he hated his life. You have another kid who just really isn't a, a fit for that program. You stumble into a learning disability you hadn't anticipated. Um, you start an account on Instagram like all good homeschoolers do, and suddenly you're seeing pictures of these ideal childhoods in these pristine, you know, rustic environments, and your house looks like an urban nightmare of chaos right? So you start to find yourself out of sync with your original vision. Exactly, right? And then you start to hate your life. That's what Susie says. That's right. Because the adage goes, if mama ain't happy, nobody's happy. But in homeschool, it's the other way around. If your kids aren't happy, mama ain't happy. Because your kids are the goal. This isn't about your fulfillment. This is about satisfying their educational opportunities. And when you see your children wilting or withering under the burden of whatever you've created for them, you're gonna be crestfallen because your goal is for this rich family life. Yes, you want them to get an education, but you want them to like you at the end of it. You want them to like each other. You want them to reflect on their childhoods favorably and to be able to say, oh, I had a great childhood. I learned so much. Yes, that's what's going on. So in this journey then, you start with a jumping in of enthusiasm and then you go into this playing school mode until mm, not really working anymore. Because what do we know about school? It does not fit the contours of home. Some of you have been listening to my scopes for a while. So this little short piece is going to be a repeat, but it's really essential before we go to the next one, okay? Um, this is for those of you who don't know my little uh, perspective on school versus home. Home has different properties than school. School is about groups, 25 or 30 kids in a room with an instructor. They have to be moved through material at a certain rate. They have to be tested on that material and they have to hit certain markers for the school district in order for that school district to receive funds, to keep going, to have the right kind of staff that they need. And so there are bells, there's recess to get a break, 
There's a lunch room that is not home. You sit on benches and you sit at tables with children that are not your friends or maybe are your friends or maybe they're torturing you as I experienced at lunch tables in school. Home is totally different. Home is where you go to get away from all that. Husbands and wives come home from outside of the home jobs expecting to take off their ties and bras. You want to let down your hair. There is no schedule. You get to be yourself. You get to put your feet up on the couch. You can take off your shoes. You can have a snack whenever you want it. You can eat lunch early if you're hungry or later if you're not. Home is about letting down. It's about relaxing. So when you bring school home, it's like fighting against the contours of home. And that's why playing school doesn't work. You know that it isn't actually school time at home because if you got a text that was really important, you'd answer it in the middle of the math lesson. You also know that if you're really tired, you will sleep in or you'll let a child sleep in. This is how we know that school doesn't suit home. So our homeschools have to suit the properties of home for them to feel natural. So once we kind of get exhausted from playing school, we move on to what I call the third stage of development. And this is where we start exploring philosophies of education to help us do a better job of being at home while providing that education. And I call this the following the method stage. After you're done playing school, you're like, there's got to be a way to do this. Someone else must have figured it out. So you go in search of a method. And there are a whole bunch of popular methods. Classical, unschooling, eclectic, programs like Sunlight or Rebecca, um, you know, Konos, which was a group, you know, a, a program I used when I was young. Uh, there's Charlotte Mason. There's Brave Rider, right? We have our own kind of style, kind of philosophy. You can be hunting around and you're going to look for some kind of methodology that is going to help you feel like you know what to do. Now, there's nothing wrong at all with adopting, especially for a season, a methodology. I don't want you to read this and think, oh, I'm following the method. I can't wait to get out of that stage. No, 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 no. Experience the method. Allow yourself to be taught by it. Indulge fully if you're interested in Charlotte Mason. Go whole hog into classical if that's what your fancy is. Here's why. When you are in this stage, you are actually training your brain. You are starting to think about educational models. Whether it's Mequon math or math you see, whatever writing ideas you've got, whatever philosophy you have for the learning of history. While you're in this stage, you are doing more to educate yourself as a home educator than probably any other stage you're going to be in. And I'm telling you, I cycled through so many different email lists and online discussion groups during that period. Fortunately for me, my discovery of all these methods happened as the internet dawned in the mid-90s. So I was instantly put in touch with people across the world that had been invisible to me in the early 90s. And that was a happy accident. I think this is true for you on a whole other level today with Periscope and Instagram and Facebook and all the social media outlets. Enjoy this season. This is a great season. Now, someone said, as long as the method serves you and you don't serve the method. Well, we're going to talk about that. But initially, you're just teaching yourself. You're like giving yourself a graduate class in what it means to educate children. So you're going to ask really meaningful questions like, well, what is the learning moment? And what do I do if a child does have ADD? What does learning look like if that's what we're dealing with? Uh, why is Charlotte Mason popular? What is it about classical education that is speaking to the core identity of so many home educators? Why is it popular? These are worthwhile questions. And reading the materials written by people who advocate and are proponents of those methods are going to contribute to your sense of confidence as a home educator. The danger. What do you think it is? Those of you who know me, what is the danger when we start following a method? 
Let's see if any of you know the language I use. I've shared it before. And I think I saw someone allude to it, but I'm going to let you come up with it. Yes, you become rigid. Purist. There you go. Ideological purity. Do you guys know that language from me? Ideological purity. What that means is you start to believe that if you follow the method perfectly, you can guarantee safe results. If you follow the method perfectly, you will guarantee safe results. That's what ideological purity promises. And the reason that this is such um, a bugaboo in homeschooling is that when you are an idealist, which all of us are who choose this path, your temptation is to believe that the method is what saves you, not the process. You are going for an outcome and you are more dedicated to the outcome by method than trusting yourself because you don't trust yourself. You don't know what the heck you're doing. You're hoping someone is going to deliver to you a package that you can follow that will protect you from all of the pain <laughs> that process orientation requires of you. Ideological purity is toxic. Angela put it right in the chat and she's right. Here's what ideological purity does that's harmful for you. One, it makes you a very judgmental person. You are going to spend your time looking at other people as role models, and you are going to judge those who fall short of your ultimate goal. You are going to believe that the people who are the proponents, that they somehow have the secret sauce. And so the closer you are to being like them, the better. And the people who aren't as close to them, you're going to shun. You might even keep them out of your co-op or criticize them on your homeschool discussion board. Or people who come to you and say, well, it's not working for me, you're going to discount their experience. You might be tempted to say, she's not doing it right. Because as long as she's not doing it right, the method can't be at fault. But if you acknowledge that even sincere people can have different experiences within the same philosophy, once you acknowledge that, you're suddenly putting yourself back in charge of the philosophy. And that's a scary place for a lot of people to be. They don't want to be that responsible. They're afraid of that level of responsibility. And I don't even want to use the they word. Let's say we. We are afraid of that level of responsibility. If we take back the controls, then we have to blame ourselves if something doesn't go right. But if we give the control to a method, we can blame the method. And guess what? That's what happens in school all the time. I go running with public school parents. They just blame the system. <laughs> they blame the teachers. They blame the tax structure. They blame the textbooks because they have no control. And it's very frustrating for them. But no one points a finger at them saying, you failed to educate your children. When you're a homeschooler, it's the other way around. It's like everyone points at you. No one is likely to say, well, maybe it's the textbook or maybe your child is struggling or maybe the context for home education isn't very good in your state or your country, right? It all gets, the finger all gets pointed back at you. So we're rooting around looking for something we can attach to that's bigger than us to relieve some of that pressure. That's where it comes from. Yes, husbands included. It is a heavy burden. Absolutely. So, so far, for those just joining me, we are going through the developmental stages of growth for home educators. And the very first one is we jump in bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, and optimistic because it casts such a compelling vision. Then we start playing school, just like you might playhouse. We jump in and we have really a lot of fun getting out the books and the pencils and sitting at the little table and planning the schedule until that gets confining and our kids give us some blowback. So then we think, well, there must be a better way. So we examine the popular methods that are out in the home education wor world. And our tendency is to cling to the method, to follow it wholeheartedly, whether that's unschooling or classical education. 
eclectic or Charlotte Mason, sunlight or a Becca, or, you know, Oak Meadow or um, Calvin, what's that one? There's, <laughs> you know, the mail order ones. There's all different ones. And we jump on the method, you know, Thomas Jefferson, uh, Brave Rider, IEW, whatever it is. And we think the method will save me, right? That's number three. So, Calvert, thank you. <laughs> I knew it wasn't Calvin. My brain is mush. All right. So what's number four? Well, once you invest inside that number, that method thoroughly, at some point, it's going to hit a wall for you, no matter what it is. Even my own method of Brave Rider and all the things, I'm glad you all say it rocks. I think so. I work really hard to keep us away from ideological purity, but there are people who apply what I suggest in a sort of methodological way and it may fail for them. Um, and if that's the case, that's okay. I want people to be successful. I don't want them to be attached to me. So here's what I'm going to say. If you get to the point, which we all do, where the attachment to the methodology somehow fails you, here's what we typically do. We swap curriculum. <laughs> These are two homeschooling convention bags. <laughs> And look how similar they are. This one's a little bigger because we just go from here and we go to here. Thank you, Rebecca. Of course you have hit some walls with Brave Writer because if you are exploring the tools, you're going to run up against your own children's limitations and everyone has their own style often. Yes, I mean, I had people last week saying to me, poetry tea time doesn't work for my family. So we have to talk about that. I don't want anyone to feel like if it doesn't work for them, they're doing something wrong. We all have our own unique packages of family life, aspirations, and interest level. And there are lots of ways to create a language-rich environment that's not the only one. All right, so here we go. Number four, swapping curriculum. So we move from one methodology to the next. We're like, all right, that can't be the right math book. Let's go get this one and see if that fixes things. Here's what's cool. Occasionally, it fixes things. That's my favorite thing. <laughs> when one thing doesn't work and you find the thing that now works, oh my gosh. I mean, what a relief. You suddenly have found something that works. But as someone is already pointing out and anticipating me, what works for one child may not work for the next. I can't tell you how many different learning to read programs I used with five kids. Probably nine. <laughs> nine programs, five kids right? Math was so elusive for me. Yes. So you just keep, you're like, okay, well, this one didn't work. I'll try this one. Well, this one didn't work. I'll try this one. How many of you are in that stage right now? You're just like in the curriculum swap. Anyone? <laughs> Only nine. That's hysterical. So similar to the methodologies, um, stage of growth, swapping curriculum is educational. Here's where I want to free you. Play with it. Treat curriculum like toys in a big sandbox for you, the mom. Stop thinking it will save your life. Try and find the unique offering that this curriculum is giving your family. How is it going to do that? How is it going to create a new understanding of this subject matter that has been opaque to you and your kids? And then use it for that. You don't have to use every aspect of every tool, but sometimes a new source of material just catalyzes an insight, changes a perspective, offers you a new way of explaining something, and that's how you get back on your writing or mathematical or historical or scientific way. And so it's a perfectly valid stage to be in. And you know, I haven't been quantifying the years because this changes every, every time. But what you are looking for is something to help you. And swapping curriculum sometimes does that. When it becomes detrimental is when you are desperate and you swap too much and too fast. I've shared before that sometimes homeschoolers believe that the only way to grow in learning is if it's hard work. 
So when you see ease and mastery developing in your kids, you think, uh-oh, they can't be learning. Look how easily she completed that page. And so you throw what I call the homeschool hand grenade into the middle of the living room by making everything hard again, getting a program that nobody knows how to use that is really good because everybody said you should be using it. And so you go out and you buy this curriculum just to make things difficult again. Oh my gosh, don't do that. <laughs> It's so exhausting. And I want you to know this too. A lot of homeschool discussion boards are built around the idea that participation is valuable when you're discussing new curriculum choices. Like there's nothing else to talk about. Like as though the main thing to talk about on this board is what are you using for grammar for second grade? What are you using for history for eighth grade? And you maybe don't even need grammar or history, but you're just so dying for the camaraderie of homeschool friends that you just make up questions, things to discuss. <laughs> you just bring up, you know, the program you're using and then you watch people dissect it. Now you've introduced all this anxiety and then you race out and buy another program to quell the anxiety. How many of you have done that? I have certainly done that. Yeah, what should I use in 10 years, right? Exactly. We've all done it. That is one of the reasons I have been such a hawk about creating community that is about discussing something else other than curriculum shopping. I think it is a big, dangerous, you know, money pit and hole for home educators. Our goal when you're at my conferences, when you hang out on my Facebook groups, when you're in the Homeschool Alliance is not to scrutinize curriculum but to work with the underlying principles of healthy family life and what is the learning moment. If we can marry those two things, there are a lot of tools that will get you an education for your kids. And that's what we spend time thinking about. That's what we talk about, okay? Yeah, oh, look at, I love how you guys keep anticipating me. Look what the planted tree says. You really have to be confident in yourself and your knowledge of your children and homeschool goals, which is stage five, you brilliant woman. Trusting yourself. Look at your little, my little heart. Trusting yourself. Now, when does that moment come? Some of you are like, I want that moment now. You can't get there any other way than these ways. Jumping in, playing school, following the method, Swapping curriculum, <laughs> and then finally, you start trusting yourself because you have been through all those developmental stages. You can't trust yourself without information, without experiences, without a ton of failure, without all your children telling you you're doing it wrong. The only way you get to trust yourself is when you have laid a solid enough foundation of all of that information inside, and then you are capable of evaluating it. Well, welcome Whitney at stage one. Stage one is such a fun stage. I want you to love these stages. None of these is bad or wrong. These are all essential to your development. Do you understand that? I don't want anyone going, oh no, I'm in the swapping curriculum stage. I must be doing it wrong. No, that's just where you are. So swap away. My only thing I want to tell you is you ultimately are going to decide what works for you. And you will get to stage five more quickly, as somebody's asking, if as you're going through the stages, you know this is coming, right? You're gonna do better going through the stages if you know that the goal is to trust yourself, not somebody outside of you. And when I say trust yourself, oh, hey, welcome Kim at stage zero. We're excited to have you jump in. If you know the goal is to trust yourself, oh, stage four, swapping curriculum, going from bag to bag of the same stuff. Um, if you know that one of the goals is to trust yourself, as you go through, maybe you'll take good notes on your journey. One of the things we do in the Homeschool Alliance is we write down narrations every month of what our kids are doing that reinforces to us that they are making progress and that they're growing. And then we take notes on our own 
thinking processes about the readings we're doing or the audio lectures or the way that other readings from outside the Alliance, curriculum we're using, therapy appointments we go to, all of that. We write notes in these what we call scatter books so that you can be deliberate about your process. The danger of these stages is the feeling of being swept about by the ocean, by the waves. And you're like, oh no, I'm swapping curriculum. Oh no, do I have the right method? And you're sort of like bouncing around and you don't feel that security of knowing that you're really in charge of your homeschool experience. You really are. The buck actually does stop with you. And here's, so we're through the first five and I'm gonna tell you there are three more. How are we doing? <laughs> oh my God, you guys are so fun. Let's see, uh, time-wise, we're doing great. Okay. Yes, everybody feels that bouncing around at one time. Oh yeah, no, there's more. Wait, there's more. <laughs> oh yes, because guess when trusting yourself, if you start homeschooling your kids for kindergarten or preschool, like let's say it's not you're in school and pulling them out, but if you start from scratch, and you make the decision to jump in and homeschool, you will hit trusting yourself somewhere in mm, junior high for your oldest child. That's when it'll hit usually. Just a guess. But guess what happens? Oh, guess what happens? High school. And you freak out all over again. It's like you have to start from scratch. So here it is. I call it the re-upping moment. The re-upping moment. Yes, because high school is like all over again. You go back to stage one. Ah! <laughs> the freaking out about high school. <laughs> because it's totally different, right? It's totally different. So here's some encouragement for you about the high school phase. The re-upping moment. First of all, you've already done all the stages. So you are about to go through a similar process with high school. You are about to sort of jump in, play school, because, oh my gosh, everybody goes from this wonderful, eclectic, trusting their self kind of homeschool, and then they suddenly are like, transcripts, right? That's what happens. And so suddenly you're like, okay, we got to get serious now. This is the really important, you know, school moment. We've got to play high school. We're going to play high school. How many of you know that feeling? You're like, I've really got to get serious. Even unschoolers go through that. They're like, well, I've been pretty unschooly, but you know, the transcript, I don't know what to do, right? Yes. Everyone freaks out about transcripts. Everybody's afraid. So the re-upping moment is real, and you might even be able to continue to do your younger kids really flowy and trusting and moving through curriculum and setting these great ideas for yourself, but that kid who tips the balance into high school is going to freak you out a little bit. That's the re-upping moment. Now, here's something for you to realize. The solutions to high school are huge. They're, they're vast and varied. And one of the things that you want to think about isn't, oh no, how do I do what I've been doing, trusting myself, setting this kind of lifestyle for my high schooler? What you wanna do is allow yourself to go back through these stages. But you can do it with more confidence now because you've already home educated for a number of years and you know your kids really well and they are capable of giving you a kind of feedback when they're teens that they couldn't give you at age eight or 10. So this moment is a re-upping not just for you, but for everyone in the family. And your kid's point of view is paramount. I want you consulting them, talking with them, admitting your anxiety, getting information. I always say, go back to research. Thank you, Carol. Carol totally knows. She homeschooled all the way through high school. Um, you have that capacity, in other words, to consider options that would never have suited an eight-year-old. 
You might do some part-time enrollment at a local high school program. You might join a co-op. You might hire a tutor. You might put your kids in public school or private school. You might want them to participate in a high school level sport or theater arts program. All of this is exciting and brand new. And you get to rethink some of your methodology. And it's okay that you do. What I wish for everybody is freedom to go through that experience and to not feel like you're on the head of a pin and you're gonna make a right or a wrong choice. Any choice you make can be unmade and rethought of. Take away the final deadline, like, oh, they have to have done everything by 18 and go off to college at 18 like everyone else. Some kids don't need to go off to college at 18. They do better having a couple more years at home under their belts. Some kids are ready by 16, and it would be a crime to make them wait until they were 18. You will know because you will know your kids, and you get to decide that in concert with them. Yeah, you've learned that the hard way. Well, guess what? We all learn pretty much everything the hard way. <laughs> and teens, oh my heavens, they love to teach you. <laughs> they didn't mean to. So the re-upping moment is going to make you cycle back through the list. Do you want to see it one more time and think about it as a high school experience? So there's the jumping in to homeschooling high school. Then there's the playing school, playing high school, thinking, okay, it's got to look like school because I have to write a transcript and they better read every classic work of Western civilization literature or they won't truly be educated. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> then there's the following of the method and you get really rigid at times. Oh, they have to be unschooled. Oh, they have to be classically educated. Oh, they need to go to school. You might find yourself in one of those binds. Then you might start swapping around. Well, it seemed like this was working, but now at 16, he's telling me he hates it, so I'm going to try this, and then that doesn't work, and so we're going to try this, and we go back and forth, right? And then at some point, you and your kids are going to trust the high school experience. You're going to find your groove, and it's going to be groovy, and you're going to love it. High school's incredible. There's so much good and fun that can happen in high school, okay? And then they go off to college, and there's no re-upping for that. It's much easier. <laughs> and finally, I've got two last stages. One of them is really not a stage as much as a definition. When you've gone through all that, and you have all these cute little kids at different ages doing different things, you have developed a custom-designed us school, us schooling. At the end, as you're in it, when you're in the thick of it, some in high school, some in college, some still at home, you will have your groove, you know, and you'll wish you had it back when they were all little. But when you get to that point, you're going to go, oh, our homeschool looks like us. It looks like us. It doesn't look like Julie Bogart or Susan Wise Bauer or Andrew Putua or Mr. Saxon or Sunlight. It's going to look like your family, us schooling, your tailor-made, custom-designed homeschool experience. That's going to be you. And once your kids are done, and it's too late for you to fix or change anything, you get this badge, the veteran, otherwise known as, phew, finished. <laughs> and then you're going to be sad like me, because you won't get to do it anymore, and you'll wish that you could, and you'll wish that you had grandchildren. Yes, exactly, grandma schooling. But you get this badge when it's over. So don't try and be a veteran while you still got kids, because you're still navigating. You're already sad. Aww. But, you know, <laughs> does the badge come with wine? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Mine comes with margaritas. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yes. So, the re-upping moment at some point is going to be followed by your confidence. Hey, our homeschool looks like us. We had our own journey. We have things to share with other homeschoolers that come from our own experiences. And they are unique to us. And the version of homeschool we did cannot be duplicated because it wasn't a method, it wasn't a program, it was our family finding its way. And these are all the pieces 
that made our family. And listen, some heartbreak is going to be in there. Some heartbreak and pain is going to be in there. That is part of your us school too. Therapy might be in there. Loss might be in there. Regret is going to be in there. That's all part of it. And it's okay. No one escapes this experience without all those elements because you're a human being and human beings are not perfect. So part of your journey to this wonderful prized moment, to the veteran moment is going to be characterized by pain. It's not all happy and there is no program that guarantees you perfect outcomes and happiness. But if you can cling to the vision of your family having its own unique story that you look back on together and no one else shares it with you except you and your family, you will find some gems. You will find some gems and your kids will come back and remind you of the things that they loved and they will take some unexpected memories into their futures that you've lost and you will all be better people and have grown for your losses and pain and for your triumphs and achievements. And there will be this collection of human beings that you love more than anyone in the world loves them who go out and make that mark on the world in their generation. And you get to know that you were an essential constituent part of that development. That's the gift of homeschooling. You were that person and it is totally worth it. I'm, I'm here to tell you, you know my story, you know the struggles, and it's still totally worth it. I don't have a single regret about being a home educator. It's one of the few things, I have regrets within home education, things I did that I wish I hadn't, right? But I don't ever regret the decision to be a homeschooler, ever. I'm so glad I was. I count it as the luckiest happenstance of circumstances that I found out about homeschooling before I was even married. And I knew I wanted to do it from the moment I heard of it. And I'm so glad I got to. And I'm so glad I got to share this with you. So shall we go back through my little group of... <laughs> All right, let's look. Where are we here? Oh, good. We're five minutes from being done. This is perfect. So if you're just joining me, I'm Julie Bogart from Brave Writer. And this is Periscope, where I spend time coaching homeschooling parents about the journey of home education and especially writing. And today we went through the natural stages of growth in writing and here they are, <laughs> natural stages of growth in home education and here they are again. Number one, you jump in and you make a big splash and you're really happy about the whole project. Number two, you start playing school. You get the books, the sharpened pencils, the flag, you say the pledge. You try to hit the markers of what you think the common core says. Playing school, it's like playing house right after you get married. Number three, when playing school gets old and doesn't work, you start following a method. You start looking into all these different ways of home educating and you get to know these methods and you try to follow one of them as closely as you can. And during this period, so much cognitive growth is going on inside of you. You're discovering both the amazing opportunities of the method and the limits of the method funneled through your personality and your family. But that's stage three. Stage four, when you get frustrated with the method, you start swapping curriculum. You're like, well, this one didn't work. I'm going to try this one. This one didn't work. I'm going to try this one. Or maybe you're just bored which, you know, I have this thing that if you're bored with a curriculum, that's a perfectly good reason to get a new one. So you want to remember number four, swapping around. Yeah, and obviously you're saying I skipped these. This is all fluid, right? This is all fluid. This is just my observations of working with thousands of families. You may or may not comport with all of these. Number five, once you've spent time playing school, learning the methods, swapping the curriculum, you will finally have a moment where you start trusting yourself. It will come and go. You won't always consistently trust yourself, but more and more, you're going to be able to say, this works for us. 
And just about the time that feels really good, <laughs> you have to re-up for high school. The re-upping moment. And that's always a little scary. And you tend to recycle through all of those stages again when you hit high school. Yes, you can be in more than one stage simultaneously. Of course you can. You might be doing method and swapping curriculum at the same time. You might be doing method and playing school at the same time. But yes, so the re-upping moment, that comes right around high school. But eventually, when you have a little collection of people who've been through high school, some of them, some of them are still in homeschool, you discover, oh, we have an us school. Our homeschool looks like us and nobody else. And when it's all done and everybody leaves your home and it's just you and a bottle of wine, <laughs> you get the badge, veteran, finished. And this is when you know more than you've ever known because you never have to test your knowledge again. And so I'm in the veteran category, but I never have to put any of my thoughts to the test again. And that means that you take my advice with a grain of salt. That's true for all veterans. I can coach you, but you're in the trenches. You know, I'm the general back in the building, safe from the bombs. <laughs> you're out on the front lines. And when you've got crises going on, you don't have to always believe that I'm right because you're going to solve things in your own way and you're going to come back and tell me, hey, this is what worked for me. And you know what I'm going to say? Oh, you're in the us schooling phase. Love that. Love that. Because, you know, I'm just giving advice. Easy for me. I'm sitting here, you know, in a house without any children. But you're not, and you have to funnel all of this through your personality and your kids' personalities and your husband's personality, right? And you're still in it. And new things are coming all the time that I don't know about because I'm not homeschooling. Someone says, I never know what to tell people what homeschool I use, what homeschool method. So here's what you tell them. You tell them, you know what? We homeschool in a way that works for each member of our family, and it combines a lot of methods. That's what I would say. I think that's a great response. The more we can demystify the idea of ideological purity, the more we give everyone permission to grow and explore the contours of homeschool. Yeah, no, of course not. Don't forget the husbands. And in fact, we have men who are the home educators and wives who are off doing the, you know, breadwinning. So I don't want to eliminate anyone. I'm all for including everyone in this experience. Uh, uh oh. Repeat what? Hmm. Oh, yeah. What kind of schooling? So it's the idea that you are doing a homeschool that is tailor-made for your family. And the more that we promote the idea that homeschool matches individual families, the more space we create for everyone else to do the same. The more we cling to a method, the more we create anxiety in the movement. We have people who start feeling like they don't get to be in the club if they aren't doing it the way I'm doing it. And that's not good. We need to support each other. And we can't do that if all the time we're looking over our shoulder to make sure that we get to participate. And the only way we can feel like we're participating is if we're welcome. But if you have to use certain language and participate a certain way, then that makes it really hard to trust yourself or have a homeschool that suits your family. Somebody asked a good question, but I didn't see it. Um, it faded before I got to it. I kind of think, though, maybe we need to save questions because now I'm over an hour. <laughs> and I want to go and I can see people are hopping off. So let's end with this. Join our Facebook group, Brave Scopes. Be sure to like me on Instagram. I'm at Julie Brave Writer on Instagram. And um, let's see, where is that? Sorry, I thought I had this open. Um, I'm at Julie Brave Writer on Instagram, and I'm also on um, Poetry Tea Time. And I don't know where that is. <laughs> so go see me on Instagram. Um, Brave Writer is the name of my company. And if you want to be a part of our coaching community, go to CoachJulieBogart.com and sign up. We'd love to have you. It's a great place to work all these ideas out where I help you 
become better at being yourselves in your own homeschool. Oh, you're so welcome. What a nice thing to say, Betsy. You're welcome. It's very nice. Well, you know, Cindy, if they will, quote, fight summer school at home, just drop it. Just drop it. Yeah, us schooling. That's a great hashtag. Also, brave schooling's a good one. Um, you got your Brave Rider box today. Good for you. That's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you so much for tuning in today, sharing the broadcast, telling people about Brave Rider and PoetryTeaTime.com. I'm very passionate about what we do, and uh, I'm grateful to have partners on the journey. So have a fabulous weekend. It's raining here. What's up with that? Uh, and um, we'll see you next week. Oh, and it's my mother's birthday today. Happy birthday to my mom, who I am going to scope with in about a week. We are going on a cruise together on the Danube River. Carol knows all about that, and we're very excited about it. It's going to be two weeks at the end of April. Um, today's her birthday, so I'm going with her to help her celebrate. And she is a published author, and we're going to do a periscope together from the boat so that we can all meet you together. I can't wait to share her with you, and she can't wait to meet all of you. So would it be okay to use Quiver Veros with a non-reader? Sure. Yes, we do need a Brave Rider cruise <laughs> with little fruit drinks and umbrellas. Yes, thank you. All right, everybody. Have a fabulous weekend. And I'll talk to you next week. We'll do some scoping next week. Bye, everyone.